Many over my lifetime, including fundamental Bible-believing Baptists, have told me, <clears throat> Ron, the Bible does not condemn alcohol. Jesus turned water into wine. Duh. <clears throat> Number one, we need to be able to discern uh, when someone is speaking something and when God is giving us an outright command, when God is talking to us. Um, you've got to be able to tell the difference. Now, the book of Job is a perfect example of that. Okay, Job, uh, everything's going wrong with Job. Job has three friends that come to visit him that tell him for 33 chapters why everything's going wrong. They say, Job, you sinned. 90% of what they said was just 100% pure baloney. There is a little bit of truth mixed in there. For instance, one guy said, well, when you're dead, you're just dead. And a lot of cults get their doctrine from the book of Job. Very dangerous. Okay, the Jehovah's Witnesses are that's one that get that, you know, when you're dead, you're dead. That's not correct. Um... <clears throat> What I've always wondered was in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 3, when God is speaking to us, God, God himself, he's, well, through the apostle Paul, he's, God is giving us the commands, he's giving us the guidelines for a bishop, for a pastor, okay? Let's read this together now. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Okay, now notice that Paul did not say, well, he should be, or maybe, okay, he emphatically said must to the qualifications of the bishop, all right? Interestingly though, pastors, they, they jump on this one wife qualification with the, the word must in mind, and then somehow they overlook the other 15 must qualifications. That, that's, it's nuts how that happens, but that it's sin, okay? Another thing here we want to concentrate on is that it, it says uh, not given to wine. So how much wine does that mean? Does that mean that they can't be drunk? Does that mean that they can't get uh, too intoxicated? No, it says not given to wine. That's not given to wine at all. Don't take in any wine. None. Zero. Zippo. Nada. Okay? All right. The next point I want to talk about here is in the, the law the law of first mention. Okay? It's it's in Bible study. In uh, it, there's, a, there's a 10 cent word called hermeneutics that just means Bible study. Um <clears throat> We, the Bible tells us Christians that we use, to use great plainness of speech, okay? But then that's what I'm going to use. We're going to call a Bible study. In the law of first mention, <clears throat> what that says is the very first time something's mentioned in the Bible, it must be very important. Normally, that defines every other time that is brought up, okay? Well, the very first time we see wine in the Bible, here in Genesis chapter 9, let's take a look at that and see how what happens here. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. All right, number one, it was Ham that went in the tent. Number two, why did Canaan get cursed? It was his dad. All right, I, do, I would like to point that out. The New Testament says the children are not to pay for the sins of their parents. Number three, this is the first mention of wine. And I'm going to cut Noah the benefit of the doubt. I don't believe it was possible for fermentation. I don't think the fermentation process was, was possible before the flood of Noah. Okay, there's been an awful lot of research you can do your own on that. Um, <clears throat> number four, though, th this is the first mention of wine, and it has to do with uh, homosexuality. Ham's a boy, Ham's a male, Ham's a guy. He walks in and sees his dad naked. Then he goes out and he tells his brothers, Hey, hey guys, come on, check this out. Dad's naked and he's, he's, he's wacko. <laughs> 
All right, now let's cover where the word wine comes from. Okay, when, they're, when they were translating the King James Bible, 1604 to 1611, they had, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, English was at its peak. It, it couldn't have gotten any better than it was. For instance, old English words like uh, the, thine, and ye, and your, um, we use your today. <clears throat> but those words, when, when, uh, when the word started with a T, it meant that he was talking to one person, to one, one single person. When he's talking to ye or your, he's talking to a multitude of people. Okay, there's a, that's, that distinction was common in the 1611 English. We've lost that because as the, the English language has gotten worse. Okay, now they also had six other English translations of the Bible at that point that they they had to work from that they could work from. Uh, the I, mean, I don't think believe they had the Wycliffe, but the Tyndale, Coverdale, Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, um, <clears throat> to come up with the 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 English this new English translation that they had. It wasn't necessarily new; it was a, a revision. Now, translating, translation is not an exact science by any stretch, okay? For instance, if you're going from your original language to your source language, um, you know, for you may have one word you're translating where you've got five, you know, five words you can use. Or you may have five words. They may have had five words for grape, grape juice, whereas we have totally different ones. Um, it says, per se, you've got so many more here in, in English. Now, at the time, we had one word for, you know, if it came from the grape, it was wine, 1611, okay? The context is the key, okay? It always is. With the King James Bible, it has a built-in dictionary, which brings me to my next point here. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not. That phrase, as the new wine is found in the cluster. Well, how in the world can wine be in the cluster, okay? What's interesting here is that when grapes are sitting there too long on the vine, they're in the cluster, they rot. All fruit, to my knowledge, does this, okay? It rots, it doesn't ferment. Fermentation does not take place, okay? Grapes left on the vine will rot. That's, that's it, that's <laughs> second law of thermodynamics. They rot. They do not produce any alcohol. They do not ferment. Now, in order to ferment, you need you need a few different things here. You need sugar. You need yeast. You need oxygen, which grapes that aren't broken, the skin's not broken, they don't get oxygen. And fourth, you need man's hands. You need man to screw around with it. You need man to play with it. You need man to do something to it, okay? Now, it only happens at the hands of, of us, okay? We can, we can make the alcohol. I mean, that's the bottom line. I, I don't believe it was possible, let alone happen before the flood. But, you know, God sent the flood because men were doing what they weren't supposed to be doing. So I, I can't be dogmatic about it. But <clears throat> what's interesting, let's turn to uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. And let's read that, okay? Exodus 12, 15. This is the very first time leaven is mentioned in the Bible. Remember that law first mentioned. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. All right, this is the very first time leaven's mentioned, and notice it uses unleavened, leaven, and leavened. Present and past time. It, it's, it's interesting the way the Bible works. <laughs> All three forms of the word. Okay. So, but who cares, right? This symbolizes the Passover. Leaven is associated with fermentation, which is a decay process. It's getting worse, not better. All right, the, process, the, the Passover required the absence of leaven. This is the spotless lamb. Now remember, Jesus is the lamb. The spotless, both the spotless, this whole thing symbolized the perfect offering for our sin. Okay, there couldn't be any decay in it. There couldn't be any sin. You have to have yeast. Otherwise, the wine is just gonna turn sour and into vinegar or acetic acid. Fermentation never takes place in anything alive. It is a decay process. It's a rotting process that's carried on with bacteria. It's ne it never occurs naturally, 
All right? Alcohol is never found in nature and it does not occur naturally. Now, what's interesting is that you know, where we get, get the word wine, it, it comes from an oriental word that means to press. What's interesting, you don't press wine out of grapes. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> but now, here, here's why collecting old dictionaries is, uh, can be an asset. All right? If we look up the word wine, in Bailey, it says, Natural wine is such as it comes from the grape without any mixture or sophistication. Well, now, what does sophistication mean? Well, <clears throat> sophistication is to mess with something. It's to change it from its naturalness, okay? Um, so in 1730, the word wine was unfermented. <clears throat> now, if we turn to, we look it up in Webster's 1828, well, here it gives two definitions, okay? The first one is fermented, while the second one is unfermented. Now, <clears throat> if we go today... When we look up wine in today's dictionary, Webster's first definition says that wine is fermented, uh, while the third one says that it, it can be both fermented or unfermented. Interesting. <clears throat> now, my point in doing all this is to show that the word wine, uh, when you find it in the Bible, it doesn't always have to mean fermented. The word wine, it, it's all dependent upon it, its context, how it's used in the Bible. It does always mean that it comes from the fruit, but whether or not it, it's uh, alcoholism, uh, for lack of a better word, is dependent on the context. Nothing more, okay? All right, now before we wrap up, before we go, I do want to cover a couple straggling issues. People will often come to me and say, well, didn't Paul tell Timothy to drink a little wine? <laughs> All right, let's take a look at this verse, all right? It says, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. It says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and often infirmities. So, now, <clears throat> you know, every drunk that calls himself a Christian uses that verse, all right? Paul, number one, is telling us, telling Timothy, rather, to, to mix a little uh, grape juice in with his water. Okay, he is not recommending alcohol for medicinal purposes. Now, number one, okay, follow me on this. The Word of God clearly condemns alcohol, period. All right, number two, alcohol is an invention of man. It never, ever occurs in nature. Number three, alcohol dulls the senses. Now, why would Paul want Timothy to dull his senses? Well, so he feels okay. Okay, well, just hold on. Number four, alcohol cures nothing, okay? It only covers the symptoms. Same thing that like cough syrup does or any medicine that you, they sell over the counter. It doesn't, you know, with the exception of antibiotics, it will not cure the disease. Nothing ever cures the disease. It just covers the symptoms so you feel better. Now, <clears throat> some Christians even think alcohol has, is a little bit as good for you. It has some nutritional value. Alcohol has no nutritional value. None, zero, no, nothing, no zero nutritional value. In fact, it has the zero with the rim erased. <laughs> you know what they used to do like hundreds of years ago? They would make a, they would tell, take the grape juice, they would dehydrate it, they would make a paste out of it. Then they would take that paste <clears throat> so they could, they could travel with it. They would uh, be able, you know, send it, they would take it other places. And when they got to wherever they were going or they were already ready to use this, this, uh, this medicinal stuff, this paste, they would mix a little bit of the paste, the concentrate in with a little bit of water. They just stir it in and it would be, that would be medicinal, okay? And then they would drink it. Now, I believe this is what Paul is using, telling Timothy to do, is to use a little bit of this paste in with his water. Okay, now God said, man, give that, that stuff to the guy who's dying. That's how much, what it's worth to him. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 6 and 7. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. So he says, give it to the guy who's dying. In fact, if we go back a couple verses... Verses 1 to 4 here, we say, uh, read, uh, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, uh, What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my bowels, 
Uh, is it not for kings, O Lemuel, and not for kings to drink wine, not for princes strong drink? So the princes and the kings aren't supposed to drink strong drink, correct? Well, what does the uh, Bible call us? Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. It says, Thou hast made us under our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So, I don't know how you can get around this. God doesn't want us to drink alcohol, period. Now, I do want to cover this before we go. Did Jesus turn the water at the wedding into alcoholic wine? Okay, let's read the scriptures here and, and see what, what the Bible says. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Um, and I, I, I chop down, eliminate some of the verses just so we can uh, make, you know, for lack of time. Uh, a marriage in Canada, Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. <clears throat> and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, We have no wine. And there were a set of six water pots of stone. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when the men have well drunk, <clears throat> then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So <clears throat> the governor of the feast was amazed he was drinking good wine at that point. We know that so a lot of time had lapsed, because he makes the the king the the king the uh, governor of the feast made a distinction between the good wine and the old wine. He explained you bring out the good wine first, then you bring out the bad wine. They won't know the difference. Well, then when <clears throat> now he's tasting good wine. So Jesus had just made that wine, and it's good. So so did Jesus make the water and wine at the wedding? Ask a Catholic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The uh, next, let's take a look at uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 39. This is another one that a lot of brothers in Christ have thrown at me. Uh, verse uh, 36, And he spake also a parable unto them, No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new ag uh, agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth a new bottle, a new wine, into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also, having drunk old wine, straightway desireth the new, for he saith, The old is better. Now <clears throat> they'll say, Well, see, Jesus said the old is better. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus didn't say that, okay? The man in the parable said that. The man that he's talking about said that. Now, in man's man's uh, man's opinion doesn't always that equal, or what man says doesn't always equal God's standards. Okay, God didn't say the old was better. Jesus Christ said the man that in the parable said the old is better. Big difference. Just slow down for a second and and read carefully when you're uh, referring to this stuff. Now we can look at the Hebrew and the Greek words that are used, see how strong this and or vines defines them, but I really don't think there's any need for that uh, because God has preserved his word like he promised in the English language, his inspired word. Um, and I think we've got more of a revelation in the English language than we would have in the, in the original Greek. Um, <clears throat> God gives us plenty of warnings about this stuff. He says, look not upon the wine. Don't even look at it. I think half of our problems would clear up if we, we just obeyed that. Now, if you think it's okay to look at it and to drink it, I well, you know, have fun with that, okay? But uh, <clears throat> until next time, this is Ron Allard, and have a God bless you.